Hello everybody, this is Laura Susan Johnson with Period Pieces, and today I'm going to review one of the only horror movies that I love. Um, there are a few. I could probably count them on maybe both hands that I love out of the horror genre. The actual horror, horror genre. Um, this also could be science fiction. And believe it or not, um, I've read some, you know, vegan books and animal rights books that have said this is one of the best f uh, movies to view if you're into being an animal rights person. Uh, and it's really not a preachy uh, thing with animal rights. It just has a, it has a scene at the beginning about chimpanzees being mistreated and you know, experimented upon. So, anyway, the movie is 28 Days Later. Um, I just put it in horror because it's kind of, a, it's an apocalyptic film, end of the world kind of thing. But it's, a, 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 you know, contrary to common, you know, common belief, I don't think it's a, zombie movie at all. I think it's a plague movie. You know, the Black Plague wiped out a, a lots and lots of people back in the day. This is what I call the Red Plague. Uh, it turns people's eyes, you know, blood red. People puke blood and they, you know, they're vicious. They go after people and kill them. Zombies tend to move extremely slowly. Um, and besides, um, most of the zombie lore, zombie movies that I've seen, you gotta shoot them in the head or cut their head off or whatever. I mean, Stephanie Meyer hasn't written any zombie movies that change all the rules yet, so, I mean, so far I think we're safe. And I, I've really never watched The Walking Dead, so I don't know if they've changed any rules, but... I say as long as Stephanie Meyer hasn't written a zombie book, I think that zombie lore is pretty much, you know, you gotta chop off their head, shoot them in the brain, something. These, uh, these creatures, these monsters, these infected people move very fast and they attack viciously. Their eyes turn bright red, they puke blood. To me, it's like rabies times a zillion. Rabies on steroids. Um, in the opening scene, when the scientist finally answers them, what are, what are these chimpanzees infected with? He says they're infected with rage. Well, and he calls it a virus. I don't know what in the hell he's talking about either, but, and that's a very vague answer. Rage is an emotion, not a disease, but whatever. The activist let out one of the uh, animals, and the animal attacks her promptly and viciously, and then she gets infected. And the infection, instead of, you know, rabies usually takes two weeks to a year to manifest symptoms. In this disease, you're infected in half a minute, tops. Anyway, Killian Murphy, one of my very favorite actors, as a matter of fact, this is the movie that got me focused on him. Um, he plays Jim, and Jim is a bicycle uh, courier, and he was delivering a package or a letter, he was supposed to anyway, then he got hit by a car, knocked off his bicycle, Obviously, he had a very bad head injury, and when we see him, he's been abandoned in a surgical bed with one side of his head obviously had been uh, had surgery on it, and you can see the scar has healed, and his head's still shaved, but he's been completely abandoned. You can see that he's still hooked up to a blood transfusion that's obviously rotten by now. He's emaciated, he's dehydrated, so as soon as he puts his scrubs on, he grabs any soda he can find walking around the hospital looking for people. There's no one to be found. 
And he, you know, drinks all the sodas he can find because he's so thirsty. And he walks around London. It's completely abandoned. It's like Omega Man. He walks to a church and he sees people for the first time after walking for miles and miles around London looking for people. And he's like, where is everybody? And he finally goes to this church, and when he says hello, these people act weird. They raise their heads up, and they look at him like he's food rather than, you know, hi, how are you? Come lay down with us. We'll tell you what happened. They don't say a word to him. And then this priest walks toward him, and he walks like he's got a corn cob stuck up, stuck up his ass or something. And Killian, you know, Jim, he immediately and instinctively knows there's something wrong with this priest. So these people, these cra crazed people, start chasing him, and he's saved by two people that just come out of nowhere, and they say, come on, come on, you know, get away from them. And uh, they throw these, I guess, uh, bombs that they made at those crazy, not zombies, and, you know, burn them up, and they take refuge in a uh, convenience store or something. And the only thing they have to eat is more soda and, more, and a bunch of chocolate candies, malt balls and stuff, Maltesers. And um, that's where they fill Jim in. Uh, there, there's a guy named Mark... Uh, and there's a girl named Selena, and they fill him in on what's happened. It started in the little towns. It really started in the laboratory, but I don't know how it spread to the little towns, and then it started to go into the cities, and by the time it went into the cities, uh, people started realizing it was already too late, blah, blah, blah. I'm not really sure exactly. Um, the exposition's a little cloudy for me, but it's okay. The main thing is uh, there's these three survivors, and the group starts to form the survival group. Selena carries this amazing machete, and I really fell in love with Selena. Uh, this is played by Naomi Harris, who I've not seen in anything else, but I, I know she's been in movies that, you know, I could easily see. I just haven't seen her in anything else. I think I'd be disappointed because she's so amazing in this movie. She's so awesome and kick-ass, and she she and her uh, machete, her sling blade, whatever you want to call it, she just, she just goes to town on these crazy red-eyed people when they, you know, and she's really blunt and pretty cynical and she tells Jim straight up you know if you get infected I'll kill you I won't I won't even think twice and um, they go Jim insists that they have to go see you know if his parents are alive and they they keep telling him you know our parents are dead our families are dead if our families are dead your family is dead and he says no 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 I've got to go see if they're alive I can walk by myself if I have to. And they, they insist, no, 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 you can't go anywhere by yourself. If you go in daylight, you still have to have somebody, you know, with you. Don't go anywhere at night, but if you have to go anywhere, you have to go in the daylight. And you shouldn't go anywhere by yourself no matter what time of the day you go. And so they go with him to his house. And, of course, yes, they are dead. And they committed suicide. And... The note they wrote on the back of his picture that they had with them in the bed indicates that they just gave up. They presume that the coma that he was in was irreversible. It's very dangerous to travel at night, of course, so they decide to spend the night at Jim's house in the downstairs section. Jim's in the kitchen reminiscing about his parents, remembering them, and suddenly some infected people just suddenly just jump through a window, break it, and try to attack him in the kitchen. And then Mark comes to his aid. 
Unfortunately, during this attack, Mark is wounded and ends up being infected. And Selena, she asks him, are you infected, Mark? And he just looks at her and she sees the look on his face and then just kills him with her machete. Just doesn't even hesitate. And Jim is just kind of dumbfounded and disillusioned a little bit. She's been left very hardened and cynical by this great tragedy that's befallen, you know, the world. Anyway, they end up leaving the house and walking on. They end up seeing uh, some Christmas lights in a high-rise building, and they decide to climb up. While they're climbing up, they are chased by even more of these fierce creatures. And they see a, a figure beckoning to come up, uh, a figure up at the top of the building. They end up meeting Frank, played by uh, Brendan Gleeson, and his daughter. Her name is Hannah, and she's played by it's Megan Burns. Anyway, these two are... Uh, great couple of characters. Um, somehow there are people that say Megan Burns gave a weak performance or an annoying performance. I thought she was a great character. She was the one that was able to jack up the car, change the tire. She was smart. She was the one that was able to dispose of one of the big villains in the picture. You know, the villains really aren't the sick people. There are worse villains, you know, in this movie, <laughs> um, later in the movie. So, I mean, this, this girl's really, I thought she did a great performance. She's mellow. She's laid back. Um, when there's, when it's time to grieve and cry and be frightened, it's, uh, definitely a good performance by her. And, of course, Brendan Gleeson, he, he's kind of a father figure. So when they meet, when Jim and Selena meet Frank and um, Hannah, it becomes a family, not just like a survival group. It becomes like a family. And it's just, a, it's, it becomes more and more of a well-rounded story not just a slasher not just a horror movie with dumb character i've seen so many you know i've tried to sit through so many stupid you know crappy badly written badly executed horror movies that are just cheap scares bad characters bad writing this is just a great movie danny boyle is a great director he has a great uh, eye for detail, a great eye for color, and a great playfully, uh, he's like a, it's not gallows humor either, it's like a playfully wicked sense of humor that he mixes in to a lot of his movies. Some of his movies don't have a, a playful humor, but this one does. This one's kind of like train spotting, but it has a little more innocence in it than train spotting does. So anyway, they uh, have a drink of creme de menthe, creme de menthe. Uh, Killian Murphy ends up cutting his hair off and shaving without the luxury of any water and soap because the plumbing is out. And to top that off, Believe it or not, it hasn't rained in London for 11 days. This plague has done something to the weather, too, for some reason. And, but they have a place to stay, and Brendan Gleeson is such a sweet, sweet, caring person. He opens his, he opens his house up to these two strangers, and he's just a good guy, very good. They end up listening to the radio, and they intercept a broadcast, a recording of somebody saying, we have the answer to the infection. Come to us. We're 27 miles north of Manchester, or something like that. Um, we have what you need. Please come to us. And so they debate amongst themselves, should we go, should we not go? Um, and they end up driving. They stop off at a grocery store, and it's a really fun scene. 
uh, a fun scene. They end up buying, you know, they don't buy anything, actually, I'm sorry. They just, they, there's nobody there. There's nobody to tell them, you know, don't shop. And there's nobody to say, hey, you're shoplifting. Brendan Gleeson just leaves his credit card behind and he buys a bunch of, ir I mean, he doesn't buy anything, I'm sorry. He just takes a bunch of irradiated apples, a bunch of peat, malt whiskey, I guess. I don't know what it is. Some kind of, you know, luxurious alcohol. Um, you know, they buy some canned goodies, some canned foods, canned unperishable foods. Um, anything that you don't have to cook that you can just eat right out of the box. Stuff like that. And uh, they have a good time shopping. It's a fun scene. Uh, it's got a fun soundtrack. The movie not only it has great music by John Murphy, you know, but it also has a fun soundtrack by different groups. Um, I forget the name. Granddaddy, that's one group. That's the shopping scene. Um, Blue States, that's the end credits. Oh, a whole bunch of people. And some church hymns that are uh, sung in a way that is soothing and, you know, non-irritating. It doesn't sound like holy roller church music, stuff like that. It's just, uh, it's, it all blends together beautifully. Uh, they drive through the countryside between London and Manchester, and it's these beautiful, just beautiful, flawless green pastures uh, with horses running happily. They're just running and enjoying their lives. They have plenty of grass to eat and there doesn't seem to be any sign of the plague there. And they take their food and they sit down and they eat their food happily and they watch the horses run. And it just seems like a paradise. There's no sign of any crazy infected people trying to kill them. They eventually make it to where the broadcast was, and it's, it's army soldiers, I guess the royal army, I don't know what England's army is, or England's military, but um, Manchester seems to be burning down, there's fire everywhere, and once they pass through that, they um, make it to this barricade, and you know, they go through that, and they, they can't find any soldiers, and they figure, oh, great, we came here for nothing. When they see that the soldiers have either died off or evacuated and abandoned the place, Selena says they should go, and Brendan Gleason's character, Frank, argues with her and says, go where? And he loses his temper and screams at her and kind of startles all three of them. The, the girl and Jim and Selena, they're all three startled. And he walks off by himself and kind of feels bad for losing his temper at them. And he sees a corpse up in the tree with a blackbird or a raven pecking at it. And he gets mad at the bird. You know, like, leave that corpse alone, get away from it, or something like that. And Blackbird's just sitting up there screeching and pecking, and Blackbird probably, I don't know if this virus is, you know, goes across species, bloodlines, or what, but anyway, he gets so angry at the bird that I think he, uh, I don't know if he swings something at it, or I forget exactly what he does, but the bird jostles the corpse around and a drop of blood from the corpse falls right into Frank's eye. And so he becomes infected really quickly. His daughter, Hannah, comes up to him and says, Dad, are you okay? And he says, I love you. I'm fine. And uh, he says, get away from me now, back away. And she's like, what are you, what's wrong? What's the matter? 
And he goes, get away, and he starts going into his rage, you know, getting the symptoms, and suddenly, as he's starting to try to attack her, uh, gunshots ring out. In the meantime, Selena's like, um, Jim, he's infected, kill him, kill him, and Jim's trying to get up the courage and the He's trying to get up the strength to kill Frank, you know, his good friend, you know, he's only known him a day or so, but they've become a family in that short time. That's what happens in these kinds of stories, you know, that's, you know, all the world has basically come to a screeching halt and you've got only a few people left alive that have their sanity intact and, you know, you can't kill somebody who's become that close to you without really, really killing part of yourself. So it's just, yeah, he really, he was ha having really a lot of trouble getting the courage up to try to kill Frank, but he didn't have to kill Frank because these bullets start ringing out and Frank drops and Hannah's just shocked and upset and... Selena's in shock, Jim's in shock, and the sh the, suddenly the soldiers are there. They were just farther down the road. Frank is dead, and the only three survivors are Jim, Selena, and Hannah. And they're taken to the military, military zone, military uh, fortress, I guess. It's this big house, like a mansion down the road and the place is run by I don't know if he's a general a sergeant maybe it's just a few soldiers too it's not a huge body of soldiers or a huge military unit it's just a few soldiers led by West played by Christopher Eccleston he's another great actor I've liked for a long long time he's the one that made this recording you know the answer to the infection is here come to us we'll we'll help you and all it is is that he's got these soldiers they're setting up a bunch of supplies and all it is is we're gonna try to start over again it's like that's not the answer to the infection it's like false advertising so immediately there's something pretty crooked about this Miss, Mr. West, I'd like to call him. All I know is he's the leader. He's got this uh, soldier named Jones who is quite comical. Um, he wears a pink apron and he does the cooking. Mostly it's canned food, tinned food as they call it. And... Um, the sad thing is, though, that a few days ago or a couple of weeks ago, General West or Sergeant West found Jones with his gun in his mouth, and he, Jones said there's no future, there's nothing to look forward to, uh, you know, so what if we're safe from these crazy red-eyed infected people? There's nothing to look forward to, so... General West, I guess, made a recording hoping to lure women to this compound. Women equals mating equals new babies equals future. But I think these soldiers don't care about babies and future. I think they care about women so they can get laid every now and then, and that equals, you know, ways to pass the time. And... Uh, does it matter if the women are willing? Nah, not really. These soldiers are really happy to have women. So here comes two women who have no idea what's in store for them. Selena and Hannah. It dawns on Jim pretty early on. Hannah is, you know, grieving her father. Selena's grieving for Hannah because when Hannah had her father and they had a father figure to kind of guide them and just be a solid presence in the little group, Selena felt more secure, I think. 
and Selena until until the loss of Frank Selena seemed like a very you know tough you know no nonsense jaded but now she's broken down a little and she seems more vulnerable I think the loss of Frank is harder on her even than it is on Hannah it seems I mean, Hannah seems to be getting through it a little bit better than Selena. And Selena seems to be falling for Jim as well. So Selena is still a very solid female character. She's one of the great, what I would call great, smart, smartly written, smartly acted, smartly portrayed female leads in a movie. I think she's awesome. Um, when, if I ever do a countdown someday of my favorite female he heroes in movies, she'll definitely be in the top ten because she's really a, a, a really great character. Anyway, um, yeah, Christopher Eccleston turns out to be a crooked character, a great villain, I would say. He introduces Jim and the rest of them to Private Mailer, who is a soldier who ended up infected somehow. And they knocked him unconscious some way and chained him up in the yard, and he pukes blood, his eyes are bright red. He attacks anybody, or he tries to attack. They got a chain around him, thank goodness, but he attempts to attack anybody who you know, approaches him. Uh, Soldier Farrell was one of the nicer characters. He was, uh, I forget who he's played by. I think he's an actor that's appeared in other movies that I've seen. But he, um, he kind of had a little bit of a like a preachy way about him, but he also was telling Killian, "They there's this plague isn't everywhere. This plague is only in Britain. This plague is not over in New York. It's not over in France. It's not over in other parts of the world. Uh, other parts of the world are continuing as usual. There's planes in the air. There's people driving to work every day. There's people in bed asleep doing just fine. This plague is in Europe and they quarantined. I mean, this plague is in England or Britain and they quarantined Britain. So, you know, it's not like it's everywhere. It's not the end of the world. It's just, you know, it's only been going on for four weeks. There'll be an end to this sooner or later. And Eccleston is a madman, you know. he's He's gone mad. He thinks it's the end of everything, and he thinks that, you know, kidnapping women and letting his men rape them and, and stockpiling all this stuff and acting like we're the only people on earth is the truth. And, you know, so I liked that character. He was nice. Unfortunately, he and, he and uh, Jim are, are not in league with, uh, they don't agree with uh, General West, Christopher Eccleston's character, so they're marched out in the woods to be executed. They ha they execute the one guy, but while they're arguing and fighting over something, uh, Jim ends up getting away from them and hiding among the corpses of the other soldiers that have been executed for whatever treason against Eccleston's character or whatever. Again, we have a megalomaniac, just like Wilford from uh, Snowpiercer. A megalomaniac who kills anybody he doesn't like or doesn't who doesn't agree with him or doesn't uh, obey him or whatever. Um, so they kill the one guy. Jim escapes and ends up uh, looking up into the sky at one point and seeing that yes, it's true, life is going on in the rest of the world. Life is continuing, and uh, there's hope. So he slowly makes his way back to the compound. A, a thunderstorm starts. And the haunted house sequence, as I like to call it, begins. There's a bunch of lightning, thunder, and 
beautifully shot scenes of Hannah running from room to room in her beautiful little red dress. The little, it's like this fairy tale. It turns into a haunted house slash fairy tale in these sequences. She's running in her glittery red dress and hiding in different rooms from the soldiers and from the private mailer. Now, Jim intentionally sets him loose because he wants some of those soldiers killed off so he can rescue uh, Hannah and Selena from the soldiers. The soldiers are the real villains, you see, along with Eccleston. Just these shots of the lightning and the colors in the rooms, it's like a haunted house. That's where the movie starts feeling like a Halloween movie. It's really amazing. The colors and the cinematography. And this movie was shot on digital, I understand. And so the colors seem, you know, there's some shots where they seem just very saturated, but it's not overly so. They're just rich. The colors are just rich and, and, and beautiful. The uh, asshole soldier, as I like to call him, I don't know his name. I, I, I'll try to get his name correct on here. You know, both his actor name and his, you know, character name, but he's the one who fucking hell, you know, constantly says, not constantly, but at least says it three times in that one scene that, you know, where they're killing zombies. But he's the one that's just hell-bent on raping Selena. He grabs her, he drags her around the haunted house. And, um, Jim ends up coming to her rescue and, you know, grabbing him and, ugh, gruesomely kills him off, really gruesomely. It's just... I can barely stand to watch that scene. But little skinny Jim beats the shit out of this asshole. And it's really nice to see the asshole go. It's just kind of a gruesome scene to watch. And because of the way he kills this guy, Selena thinks, Man, I think Jim's infected. And so as soon as the guy's dead, she's got her machete ready for Jim. And uh, then she realizes, no, he's not infected. Because he would have come after her. He would have really just charged her and killed her. but Or tried to kill her. You know, she's quick with her machete, but he would have tried to beat, in the, you know, beat her up, ch uh, bitten her. He would have tried to have done a whole lot, but he didn't. And she sees his eyes aren't red. So he kisses her, and then Hannah comes up and clobbers him over the head or something. I thought he was biting you. I was kissing her. It was really funny. Well, they think that they're, you know, able to get the hell out of there. But Christopher Eccleston shows up, and he says, You killed all my boys, and he shoots Killian in the stomach. So they drive Killian to the hospital, and there's this alternate ending that, you know, that's more of a grim ending for the story, and I didn't like it that much. I liked the, the uh, ending that they ended up putting in the movie. I'm sure it was had to be reshot. Maybe the original ending, or the alternate, whichever it is, tested poorly with audiences or something, but... I, you know, the alternate dark ending, you know, could be very thought-provoking. But that didn't provide a satisfactory ending to the story. I mean, where do Selena and, you know, the girl go from there? It's just like more battling that you don't see. Whereas the ending that they ended up putting into the film, you know, and leaving there, going with so much more satisfactory it's so much it's just so much better it just and that you know I've never seen 28 weeks later or whatever came after that I just know that 28 days later has a great ending 
I like the ending. It's optimistic. It's It shows you that these mad people with the red plague, they starved to death or something, but you can see them crawling around just dying at some point. And it's that's why I like this movie. I, I don't think I like movies of this nature that have a grim ending. I think... I think that's uh, why I like any movie. If it has an ending that pisses me off, then it just doesn't seem... Well, if it has an ending that pisses me off, I'm not going to give it a good rating, of course, but if it has an ending that just has two women walking out, you know, to an unknown, uncertain future, probably right, right into the arms of more crazed, infected people, then there's no completeness to the story. All I know is it's a great movie. I give it 10 out of 10. Um, I think I like it better than I liked it when I first watched it, which was way back in 2003, I think it was, or 2004. I can't remember. It's been a long, long time. I think I gave it an 8 out of 10 on the IMDb page uh, back in 2010, I think. So anyway, that's my review. Um, I'll try to review a couple more Halloween movies before I'm through.